The reading this morning is Isaiah chapter 38 and can be found on page 723. <clears throat> In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you <coughs> and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun Go back the ten steps, it has gone down on the stairway of Amos. So the sunlight went back the ten steps, it had gone down. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I said, in the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? I said, I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living. No longer will I look on my fellow man or be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life, and he has cut me off from the loom. Day and night you made an end of me. I waited patiently till dawn, but like a lion he broke all my bones. Day and night you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or thrush. I moaned like a morning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I am being threatened. Lord, come to my aid. But what can I say? He has spoken to me and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things people live and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot cleanse you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they praise you as I am doing today. Parents tell their children about your faithfulness. The Lord will save me and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Isaiah had said, prepare a poultice of figs and apply it to the boil, and he will recover. Hezekiah had asked, what will be the sign that I will go up to the temple of the Lord? This is the word of the Lord.
I haven't done a PowerPoint today, so I thought we may as well have the mics on. Um, this, even if you don't want to see my face, you'll be able to look at the uh, Bible a bit more easily and see God's word there. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, I'm on. That's right. This is channel five. Um, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word to us. Please help us to learn from Hezekiah and from your words through Isaiah. Help us to trust and obey. Amen. Well, we've reached the end, not just of this third mini-series in Isaiah, but at the end of a major section in the book of Isaiah, there's going to be a major change for the second half of the book from chapter 40, which we might come back to in the autumn or maybe next year. And it becomes so different in tone from chapter 40 through to 66 than it's been from chapter 1 to 39. But some people think it can't have been written by the same person, that Isaiah must have been actually two different people. Am I standing? That's OK. Um, and this section of the book finishes with what seems to me quite an anticlimax. And it turns out that it's fairly clear, I think, that it's out of chronological sequence, the way the order that we read things in in the book is not the same as the order that they happened in. And I say this because the Assyrian attack that we read about last week, which failed, rescue of the city of Jerusalem, we know happened in 701 BC. And we know that Hezekiah, the king of Judah, died in 687 BC. If you're following these numbers, don't forget that they go backwards when you're BC. But try to do the maths. Um, 15 years earlier would have been 702 BC. And I say 15 years because do you remember what God said to him through Isaiah? In verse 5. Uh, I'm not on the wrong page, chapter 38, 15 years to be alive. It's page 723, um, lost the page. It's chapter 38. I was praying about his illness. Amazing dramatic incident where God rescued Jerusalem and so sent the Assyrians packing up as so many of them died. And chapter 38, verse 6 also implies that this was before last week's events because there's the promise in verse 6 I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. That's what we've seen happen. Why has it been shuffled up like this? Well, I don't think it's an accident. I think Isaiah, or possibly somebody who is arranging Isaiah's material later on, has deliberately arranged it to end this section this way for us, to end with something of an anticlimax. And it's preparing us for understanding in Judah. Uh, for a time when the threat will no longer be the great power of Assyria, but we've seen Assyria is on the way out, and the next superpower to arise is the Empire of Babylon, and that's going to dominate. In fact, if you know your Old Testament history, you'll probably be aware that the Babylonians defeated Jerusalem. They did break into the city, and it was a terrible disaster. Prayers appeared not to be answered. In fact, God appeared to be defeated. And the events of chapter 
38 are preparation, preparation for Hezekiah for the events we read last week, but preparation for us, the reader as well, and the people of Judah in that time for coping with the apparent disaster that would come a hundred years later. Um, if I had a PowerPoint, you would be seeing three headings, personal crisis, chapter 38, verses 1 to 8, then uh, celebration of deliverance, verses 9 to 22, and then the bit that we didn't read, but we'll have a, a look to, chapter 39, compromise on the key principle. So personal crisis, Hezekiah prays a prayer in verses one to three, we see that we had a diagnosis and it's not good. He's going to die. And I wonder if you can identify with or imagine how he felt in learning that he is about to die. Put your house in order, you're going to die, you're not recovered. Well, he is distressed. He wept bitterly. There was so much that he wanted still to see in life, and it was going to be taken from him. So he cried out to God. And then the answer is confirmed in verses 4 to 8. There's the message in verse 5. This is what the Lord, the God of your father, David, that's significant, we'll come back to that later, says, I've heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. God answers prayer. It's worth praying when we have a seemingly desperate situation. We're in bad health. Nothing is beyond God's power. He's able to deal with with it. He's able to have 15 years to help uh, life. How, how does he know God can do this? Well, God gives him an extraordinary sign. I'll make the shadow, verse 8, cast by the sun, go back to 10 steps. It's gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. Now, I don't think anybody knows for sure what the stairway of Ahaz exactly was. It seems to be some kind of, of sundial. Whether it was deliberately built as a sundial, there's a flight of steps somewhere where a shadow, maybe a building or a tower or something, falls on it. And as it moves, as the sun moves, the shadow moves, it turns out that it marks out the time. Whether it was deliberately built like that or by accident happened doesn't really make any difference. It was a kind of sundial. And another possibility is that it was actually not a real flight of steps, but a model one on a portable sundial, a small thing. Yes, but you wear on your wrist, probably yeah. not. Then it would keep changing in relation to the sun, but thanks for that suggestion, Nigel. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't really make any difference what exactly it was. And neither does it make any difference, I think, how God caused this to happen. And it's something that has often troubled me to think, well, yes, I believe God could do it, but does it mean that the world started turning in the opposite direction for the sun to go the other way and the shadow to move the other way? And then wouldn't that mean there would be tsunamis in other parts of the world if it suddenly changed? And I don't know, but I do know God can do anything. Maybe he made time to go backwards. Maybe it wasn't that the world started turning the other way, but that the thing casting the shadow moved, the building rotated or leant or something, or uh, there was a reflection somehow. But whatever it was, God did something amazing. And I don't think we should say, this is ridiculous, I can't believe this. Because that betrays a wrong attitude to God, the creator. He is able to do anything if he made the world. So even if we don't understand how it could have happened, let's believe that God caused this shadow 
to go back the steps that have gone down on the stairway of Ahaz, whatever that means. And one thing it means is if God can add 10 units of time to a day, he can add 15 years of life to Hezekiah. All the times are in his hands. God is in control. And Hezekiah gets better. Um, we read later on um, that it was the, there was a poultice of figs applied to the boil. And there's a bit more detail about that in the parallel passage in, in Two Kings, if you're interested in reading that up later. So we come to the celebration of deliverance. Hezekiah writes this poem or this song. Um, he speaks very poetically about, he writes um, about his illness and recovery. He's realistic about his need. In verses 9 to 14, he is describing how desperate he felt. It's all gone. Am I going to be robbed of the rest of my years? My house has been pulled down, my life taken from me. And so he's crying like a, a bird. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens, I'm being threatened. Lord, come to my aid. Do we need to do that? Do we need to pray, to ask someone to help us? Pray like Hezekiah did with Isaiah. Last week, we got some desperate need. Well, in Hezekiah's case, the answer came. Verse 15, what can I say? He's spoken to me, and he himself has done this. What it means is that he is being shaped for the future. I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. Why does God allow us to go through such painful times? You ever ask that? Well, Hezekiah could see God had allowed him to have this, to shape him for the future. He faces the future with more of a humility. I will walk humbly all my years. And you've heard me talk before about how God has used that kind of thing to shape me and help me rely on him. We have an experience close to death. Um, several of us can testify how that changes our outlook and so uh, helps us trust God. And verse 17, he can even say, surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You put all my sins behind your back. He's being shaped for the future. And it may be, I think he can't really see much about the afterlife or life after death. Um, it's often in the Old Testament, people don't have much of an idea of how death could not be the end. They've got a bit of an idea of people being down in the pit, but they haven't seen Jesus risen from the dead. They don't know that there is this life ahead with a fully restored, renewed body that is more real than the ones we have now. But living, praise God. He's being prepared for the future. I think he having experienced God's goodness here in the answer to prayer, prepares him for what happens the following year when there's a, a bigger disaster happening, not just for him as an individual, but as a king, the nation and the city about to be destroyed by the Assyrians seeing God's goodness because his experience has, has fueled his prayer, has enabled his prayer, has given a foundation for it. 
maybe God will use difficulties, answers to prayer in your life to prepare you for future difficulties. After all this and these great intentions for the future, we see in chapter 39 something quite disappointing, really. Compromise on the key principle. The key principle of fearing the Lord, trusting, obeying, and trust his promises rather than human policies. And it comes about because... Flattery subverts faith. We haven't read chapter 39 uh, out loud, but have a look at that. Um, at that time, Marduk Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he'd heard of his illness and recovery. Hezekiah received the envoys, the people who brought the gift and letters, gladly and showed them what was in his storehouses. Everything. What's happening in these letters on the occasion of his illness and recovery is that the Babylons are trying to sign Hezekiah and Judah to an anti Assyrian alliance. Remember, this is before the decline of the Assyrian Empire. The Babylonians are trying to recruit a group of nations to get together and rebel. And Hezekiah is flattered by this. Little Judah is being considered strategically important enough by big Babylon that he gets a bit carried away and he says, look, look at all I've got to offer. Look at, look at our armor. And we've got all these treasures. He's flirting, I think, with confidence in human policies as an alternative to God's promises and his pride overcomes his faith it's extraordinary i think how pride is often seen as a virtue these days it used to be considered one of the seven deadly sins and pride in one form or another is often what stops us trusting Jesus. And God's judgment in response to Hezekiah's wrong step here removes the blessing. And do you see how the punishment fits the crime in verse 6? The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. What did Hezekiah get wrong? He, he trusted God in, in the big emergency, the crisis, and he experienced God's blessing and rescue, but he failed to live a life of trust. Are we like that? Do we find it easier to trust God in the big crisis than in our whole lifestyle? On a national level, I'm reminded of the extraordinary deliverance of this nation in World War II that followed a mass expression of calling on God in desperation as the king called for a, a day of national prayer. But is that reliance on God our ongoing orientation, or can we go it alone without God? Well, clearly we can't expect non-Christian people to follow and live a life of, of trusting God's promises. But what about on the church and individual level? How can you and I avoid slipping into the fatal error of pride when we're not in such a crisis? If you are challenged by that, maybe you want to 
pray about that. Uh, and a number of things, a number of points, what I've said so far already, I've been thinking it could be a really good opportunity this morning to go for, to ask for prayer ministry. Uh, Phil and Molly are going to be hiding behind their screens. You can see a cross over there on the table tennis table <laughs> after the service over coffee. And so if you're challenged about this and want God's help in living an ongoing life of faithfulness, relying on his promises, why not go and ask Phil and Molly to pray with you about it? Or if you've got the, the illness like Hezekiah, you're worried about something that you desperately need God's help for. You can pray yourself, you can ask other people to pray with you. I find um, in chapter 39, the, the last verse of this section of Isaiah profoundly disappointing. He's just been told in, about all this treasure being carried off. And verse 7, some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Oh, you'd be cut to the heart by that. Verse 8, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good, as I replied, for he thought there'll be peace and security in my lifetime. Is, is that what we expect from a good king? Just think what's going to happen in my lifetime, not care about the future generations. King Hezekiah was a good king, as good as a king gets in what we saw last week. He was so flawed. Exile for Judah must come because the nation reflects the king's unwillingness to trust in God alone. Um, verses six to seven are fulfilled a hundred years later when the Babylonians break into Jerusalem and take the block into exile and the, the king includes. The the worst thing about this, and we might think that would be a terribly distressing for Hezekiah, the worst thing for God's people is when they think about God's promise to David. Remember, Hezekiah was described as a son of David. He was many generations after King David. Um, but God's promise to David had come many generations earlier. And um, I don't know how we're doing for time, but uh, let's have a quick look on, look back rather to 2 Samuel, um, page 310. And um, there's the heading on page 310, God's promise to, to David, 2 Samuel 7. And verse 11, halfway through the verse, God said to him, the Lord declares to you, David, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. At first, we think it's talking about an individual, Solomon, and then realize it's a line of kings descended from him, spoken of figuratively as, as if it were an individual son. And so uh, that's what verses 13 to 16 are saying. The line of David, verse 16, shall endure forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, Hezekiah is a Davidic king, and his great-great-great-grandson will be king a hundred years later when disaster strikes, and eunuchs can't have children. So how can it be that the son of David will be king forever? Will God not keep his promise? Is this total disaster for God's people. Um, with that cliffhanger, 
we finished season three, episode six of Isaiah. Let's just have a sneak preview of season four, Isaiah 40 to 55. And we, I'll give you a tip off. It's going to be good news. God will keep his promise. And guess what? It's all about Jesus.